the DRC, the Allied Democratic Forces this week made another attempt to launch a guerrilla war in Uganda, staging two attacks in the western district of Ntoroko. The sharp-witted response from the UPDF may have calmed tensions in the region, but it left gaping questions unanswered. The first and most important one being just how strong and what capacity does the ADF have to attack Uganda? What has become of the Operation Shuja, a costly but necessary effort of the UPDF in the Eastern DRC designed to stop the ADF? What does the attack portend for the region where peace efforts are currently underway to solve the Eastern DRC problem? Tonight on the spot, we speak we seek these answers and we speak to Jonathan Tabalanga, a seasoned analyst and lecturer of international relations. And we also speak directly to the NMG correspondent in Toroko to paint a picture on the ground. But before we do that, I just want to show you where Toroko is and the places we are talking about. Toroko is, of course, in western Uganda, right there in the eastern Rift Valley or the Western Rift Valley of our country. And, and here is where the rebels came, crossing from the Democratic Republic of Congo to areas of Makondo to Rwebisengo. And uh, because they were coming with the canoes, so they were intercepted. It appears the UPDF got some intelligence. Of course, they have been in, the, in areas of Rwebisengo and the DRC. They have both the terrain and the social intelligence to understand what was going on. It appears perhaps the rebels were caught flat-footed, not knowing that the UPDF had information they were coming in. And of course, when they came in right here, after crossing Semulik River, they were routed by the UPDF. A number of them were killed. Some of them were captured alive. And it appears about four of them died and have not been accounted for. Some analysts think perhaps they could have perished in the Semulik River or around their uh, Lake Albert. That is the situation like. Rwebisengo is right on the border of the Democratic Republic of Congo, areas of Makondo, of Itojo, and Changabukama. And uh, by the way, this is not far away from Fort Porto and the areas of Nyakagongo. Those are villages around. So this is an area where ADF has had quite some time. 20 years ago, this is an area where they operated for many years. They were routed. They went to the DRC. And uh, for 20 years, they have been waiting. And they became a problem to the people of the Eastern DRC until when they tried to come in. But we're talking about people who were just having AK-47, IEDs, or improvised explosive devices, and we're also talking about young people, children to be exact, 14, 16, or 12 years of age, thinking that they can be able to take on a conventional army that has an air force, have artillery, and have all these sophisticated guns. If this was not suicidal, what is this? But I just want now to get in touch with our correspondent, NMG correspondent best and in Toroko, Mr. Alex Ashaba. I understand Alex Ashaba has been standing online. Alex, can you hear me? Yes, Patrick. Yes, Patrick. Okay, Alex, um, if you could just bring us to speed on what we need to know as somebody who is based in Toroko, uh, what is the situation like, and what do you remember, what were you able to see of uh, uh, the operation there? I understand the UPDF is trying to do a mop-up operation of the area, trying to see if there are any remnants of the ADF still maybe uh, it, it, uh, you know, hiding in, in the areas of Ntoroko. Just bring us to speed, Alex. Thanks, Patrick, and our viewers on the spot tonight. I'm Alex Ashawa, here based in Ntoroko district. Uh, at the board of Uganda and the DRC Congo, just as you are in Ntoroko, just the stone throw on the other side of DRC Congo. Uh, to our viewers, uh, what, you want, what I want you to understand is that uh, where the incident happened is in the sub-county called Bwiramore, not Rwebsengo. Uh, this is a sub-county that borders with the DRC Congo that is being separated by River Semurichi. Uh, it, you have to remember it was on Tuesday at around 7 a.m. in the morning after these revenants had closed uh, on River Semurichi coming to Buiramore sub-county. And because the locals in the area are too vigilant, they had to uh, start seeing people walking on the road. Some had the guns. Others they were in the army for attires. And the, the locals uh, were, were too suspicious. They started saying, ah, who, who could be these people? 
and uh, because of their vigilance, they started calling the UPDF soldiers. Because uh, if you look at the uh, sub counties, uh, where the, the balance of Chubuk, where it is, it is also a few kilometers away. So they had called the soldiers, and the soldiers had come in on a high speed and intercepted in the areas of Kayanja. I just want, and if you can stop there, Alex, if you are hearing me. Alex, yes. if, if you can stop there, Alex, because the communities living in Toroko are actually more or less the same communities living across in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I'm wondering, because these are same people, you know, maybe you have your cousins across the river in the Congo and other people here in Toroko. I mean, how could they be able to cross without being, uh, you know, seen by the cattle-keeping community across the river? Who are the Hema or the Batuku, if you, I want to be very exact? without them giving information? Or how could they have lived in that area that is inhabited by the same people across the river? What I want you to understand and, and the viewers is that the, the natives of Ndoroko, majority of them, they are relatives, they are friends, they, they also live in areas of their Congo. Yes. In fact, one of the persons that was killed was on his way going to the RT Congo and he was intercepted by these records. But the way how these records cross, these they cross at night. And by early in the morning at around the seven, when people were trying to wake up to go and look after their animals, that's when they started seeing them cutting and they were uh, they were armed. And the records in the area they they, they distinguish between the, the UPDF attires uh, uh, the combat and those of the of the remnants. Uh, these are the same people who had, after, intercept, after being intercepted, they started shooting in the air. Because they had to say that if these are uh, UPDF, they shouldn't be shooting on their own citizens. So at the, end, at, the, at the end of the day, the locals had started moving. But the vigilance of the local communities around calling the UPDF. And if you look at the terrain of, of Ntoroko, especially if they were very some sub county. This is the area that is totally flat. flat. Because if somebody stands in a distance, you are able to see somebody in five kilometers. If you if you may stop there uh, Ashaba Alex, um you understand the local terrain there and, and, and the, the terrain intelligence of that area. What what I want to know is that how is it possible for these rebels to cross a huge area inhabited by the cattle communities across the Congo, who are the same people living in Toroko, and yet they couldn't be able, I mean, imagining, to survive the other side of the Congo, which should be a hostile territory for them to walk through it, get some canoes, cross the river, and come and attack in Toroko. What I want to, our viewers to understand is that if you look at the terrain at the border where Fatim Rich is, the side of Ntoroko district, it is purely, uh, has no grass. But a few meters immediately after Fatim Rich on the side of the DRC Congo, it is, it is purely, purely some parts have shrubs, have forests, and it is some sources have told us that the way how these people cross, they found some of the fishermen on the right. They used their boat to come and cross. But because the area of the side of, of, of the Arati Congo has very many shrubs on, on, the, on the banks of, of, of Ratemrishi, the, the people took the advantage of that. To, to use that and um, that forested area uh, 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 around the street of Ratam to come, uh, come hiding. But when immediately they cross, because our terrain and, uh, 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 and our the nature of the land uh, uh, in, in Guaramare, there is no grass, there, there is no water, they, 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 they were visible still. And that's why the locals were able to identify, to know that these people are what? Are, are, are rebels. But if these people had not been intercepted and they moved at this frontier, you know, Toro has Toro Gemurich 
It is also for instance, if these records had taken advantage and written those in those areas, they were going to hide. But now, as of recent, as the UPDF is trying to track out all these records, they are also finding it hard. Because uh, they, there are some county, uh, some area, some areas are practiced. For the last three years, they have brought some traps in some in some areas. This after after uh, being checked, they go and hide. And the place is too water up. And if you look at the way how these, the rebels have, they, are, they, are, they have been checked, they are checked, they go and, uh, and swim in the water. So, so can, can somebody conclude that uh, their failed attempt to attack Uganda was also because of the failure to understand the terrain of the area? After all, crossing River Semeliki, which has now burst its banks for the last three, three years, some sub-countries are almost, almost submerged, some schools have actually even been evacuated because of the water. So does that also tell us this ADF did not have an intelligence to understand the kind of geography, the kind of terrain where they are coming, but also it's suicide on their part because if you cross River Semuliki and, and you're only having exp improvised explosive devices and simple AK-47, you want to take on an army, which is a conventional army, in case of retreat, it was going to be very hard for them to get back to the Congo because simply they would not be able to withstand the firepower at the same time to be able to retreat on their canoes going back to the Congo. I, I agree with you. If you look at terrain, at terrain, it has greatly, greatly impacted on the ADRF to continue their work. Because you, you, will, you will not move more than a kilometer minus, minus being in water. And this water has salt. That is the, that, that, that is the environment. The air that was once a land. And if you are not moving on road, if you decide to move in uh, away from the road, that means you, 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 are, you are moving in water. And the UPDF is taking advantage of that to ensure that, that they know the area. So we, we understand about four remnants of the ADF are not accounted for because some were killed, some were captured, others uh, were injured. But about four of them, to the, because they thought they could have been 40 in number, so is it possible they are still hiding in an op open area, open grass of Buntoroko, or perhaps they could have died in the river? What I want yesterday we had a security meeting in Guayamore. You know, on the 30th, the Tuesday, there was like a kind of a fresh attack, but did not know the rebels crossing again. The, 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 the UPDF soldiers who were coming on the night patrol, they have to intercept seven rebels. And of these seven, they had still two and five are still hiding in those box I've been telling you. So Alex, you are, so Alex, you are saying seven more suspected ADF rebels crossed as of Tuesday into no, no, Uganda. No, no. Yes. No, 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 no. The seven I'm talking about, they are part of the other first group that crossed on the team. Okay. Because the, the total number so far now, the 20, 23 rebels have been killed. 15 of them have been captured alive. Seven, according to yesterday's security meeting, Okay, I will understand that. Thank you very much. But also, let's face this. I have seen the images of the so-called ADF rebels. Uh, frankly, we are talking about children. And for those who were killed, these are, these are children, are they not? If, if, Patrick, if you look at the, 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 the ADF rebels that have been captured, they are the you may think that these are kids of 12, 13, 14. But these, these are people who are armed. They managed to kill one PDF soldier during the gun exchange. And you can't tell that somebody of 10 years who has been in, in, in that side of the other being trained, 
you can't go in the daytime. Yes, we I understand I understand that there, there are people who are armed, they are dangerous, mm. they are tested and they have killed. But you mm -hmm. can also not take away the fact that these are children, especially yeah. when the UPDF, which is a conventional army, uh, uh, goes on a, on, on a victory lap to say they have killed ADF rebels. Yes, true, they have. But let us not forget these are Ugandan children, also perhaps who have been mislaid. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 the, truth, the truth is a rebel remains a rebel, irrespective of the age, irrespective of the size, irrespective of what. But uh, at the end of the day, the damage that they are caused so far now, over 8,000 people are not living in their home. They All are right. now All right, Alex. Mm. All right, Alex Ashaba, our NMG correspondent based in Toroko, I want to thank you so much for having been able to bring us to speed on what is happening in Toroko. And because you are the, our eyes and ears on the ground, please, um, we'll be getting back to you. But for now, we want to say kwaheri. Thank you so much. Okay, we are. That was Alex um, uh, Ashaba, who is uh, our correspondent best in, in Toroko, and uh, he's giving us the latest from that side, and of course explaining some of the things that we do not know. And uh, so with us, I have uh, uh, an analyst and a lecturer of international relations, Mr. Tabalanga. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. I'm sure you have listened to Alex's report, and I'm sure you've been following these issues. I mean, you as somebody who is a professional in international relations, you understand this region more than most of us. What do you make of all this? Well, um, one of the most disturbing uh, statements, of course, um, coming from Toroko is the fact that uh, the UPDF is engaging um, kids of 17, 12, and 13. Of course, the reporter, Alex Ashaba, insists that uh, rebels are always rebels. But if you look at uh, the structures of the UN um, um, General Assembly in terms of uh, the convention itself, Children are children. Children are not supposed to engage in war. They are always forced to engage in yeah, war. Yeah, but we're talking about children, uh, uh, Mr. Tabalanga, who have killed. We're talking about children who are carrying weapons of war. Yes. Uh, children who are able to make explosive devices. Children who have caused now uh, the displacement of over 8,000 people. So the game changes there, doesn't it? It does. It does, but also um, it shows, it speaks to the capacity of the UPDF. Uh, in terms of engagement, if you fighting children who are 12, 13, and 14, and you're taking a victory lap, uh, for me that is unfortunate because if you really have 20 rebels killed and all of them are not 18 but only below 18, then it means there's a problem within our structure. So what do you make of, uh, we have Operation Suja, mm -hmm. a costly, but according to my producer, a necessary engagement in the DRC. And, and, and they are supposed to have stopped all this. For these rebels sort of outflank you and come to your rear side, what could have gone wrong with them understanding, is it the failure for the UPDF to understand the, the terrain intelligence of the Congo, that rebels could just go behind you and then they want to outflank you? It's always difficult to operate in a, a foreign land, especially if you're um, uh, fighting a rebel group that has been living there for over uh, 20 years. And we know that uh, they understand the terrain better than the UPDF. They know where to hide. They know the social structure in these areas. And therefore, it is quite difficult for the UPDF to um, find these rebels. Some of them will hide in communities and will pretend as if there are people who are going about their business. And this is really a problem not only for the UPDF, but f for all those countries that are pursuing rebels in other foreign lands. You've seen the US fighting in Afghanistan and it was a disaster because these um, Afghan soldiers or rebel soldiers would hide in the hills. Um, this is their land, they know it yes, better. they know it better. So it is not a problem for the UPD alone, it's a problem worldwide. You've seen what happens in Syria, uh, what has happened in Cameroon, um, what has happened in, uh, in Nigeria. These are problems that, are, of course, our armies are not also well trained. Let me let me get you. Um, we have a we have a, 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 a sound bite of the chief of defense forces. I think uh, talking about these attacks. Uh, if my producer could just play, we'll get to know uh, what the, where the the UPDF stands on this. Twenty-eight DF fighters were killed, while fifteen others were captured following the hot pursuit. Sixteen submachine gun rifles 
one pick a machine gun, ammunition and assortment of improvised bomb making materials and other items were covered. ADF abandoned their main operation base in Kambiayuha, lost huge amounts of their logistical stores, hundreds of other militants fled, hitherto they were well entrenched positions scattering deeper into the hinterland. Of course, that's not the CDF, that's the spokesperson of the UPDF, Brigadier General Felix College. But we also had the CDF, uh, uh, General Mbadi, Wilson Mbadi, uh, speak about this issue. So, if we can have him. I'm trying to get you that. But y y you can see, um, I hope you heard what the, 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 the Brigadier General was saying. And we know that Uganda is, is spending a lot of resources, material and, and, and money into the Congo. And we thought this is, shouldn't really have happened, even though it did. But now I understand now we can be able to get what the Chief of Defense Forces said a couple of days back. Yes. The security threats that uh, we are dealing with now and those that may emerge in the future. I therefore want to take this opportunity to thank the CLF and uh, Mountain uh, Division for the job well done the recently. How our Shambazi were able to divert Wakaingia water wa Meisha. What? Hakuna Moja Ali or Rudi. When you are able to Rudi and Ogopa Moto, Major Katsaidi and Ekachukua Kwaleki. But we can account for all those who crossed, tried to cross. But I was watching saying, how could ADF Murienda Oko Manasema Munenda Kuapiga? Arav, how could they cross? Ah ah. Nani we went you na you kuzugumuza na awa. We were be a pana, this is a tactic. We were canalizing them where we can deal with them. To Nangaria Oko Sasaha to one. And that's what exactly we did. Well, was that a trap? Well, that's what he's saying. That uh, some people were asking, how could, how, how could this have happened when you are in the Congo? That they laid a trap and so the ADF just landed in their trap. And that they can account for everybody, for those who did not get that the river helped them to finish the job. Does it though, though about two days back, there was another engagement of the UPDF and uh, suspected ADF rebels. So it appears they're still maybe perhaps heading in plain sight. What do you make of all this? Does it mean um, if you listen to um, the general body, the general, general body um, he says that they laid a trap. Does it mean that they've finished all the rebel elements in the DRC? Laying a trap means that you've uh, strategically um, combed areas and then you are aware that uh, where you are, um, people have moved this side and therefore you're going to destroy the enemy. So for me, I think um, these are, they might have been sent to Uganda by their bosses to check um, the readiness of uh, the UPDF. But also uh, it speaks to the fact that um, there's some kind of panic uh, when it comes to uh, this side of ours. Um, things are not being done the right way uh, because, I mean, um, we are talking about uh, 30, 20 soldiers, and this is really a, a very, very big issue. We know the capabilities of the UPDF. They dealt with the LRA strongly, and they pushed them to Garamba, to Chad, and this... They have dealt with Al-Shabaab, Al for heaven's Al sake. Al-Shabaab, for heaven's sake. And this, these are... If you even and listen, they are in Guinea. Even if you listen to the president speak about the, AP, the ADF, it, you may think that this is a very small... Um, uh, bandit uh, group where they just roam villages and then so uh, my question is why is it that we've had this problem for 20 years and I would wish um, uh, the CDF would answer that question. By the us. way we are supposed to have had oh, as with you here um, uh, Brigadier General Felix Kulaiji on this show but for some unavoidable circumstances has not been able to make it here. Uh, I thought I should explain that but what, have, what about the facts that we have children who are sent by their commanders to come and attack a conventional army. Some of your best weapons are improvised explosive devices, for heaven's sake. You have AK-47s, 
and and and, and you think and you're just 40 of you i mean how suicidal can there. that be are they inspired by the fact that at one time there were 27 <laughs> soldiers who had took, took on a, you know, a government force? Because it's almost incomprehensible that 40 people can cross on a canoe with just an IED, an AK-47. You're going to take on a country with a force of, you know, of tanks, of artillery, of air force, trained, battle-hardened guys. So, so, so what do you make about of the training these young people got from their commanders for them to be able to accept, let's go, and for the feel that maybe victory can be on their side? It's, it's unimaginable on my side. I, 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 first of all, I don't think 40 people can overwhelm the UPDF. Uh, 30 or 40, even 100 uh, crossing over River Seven, which is also very dangerous. Ashaba talks about a terrain that is very, very uh, difficult to navigate. Now, uh, if you're talking about 40 people trying to cross to go and attack the UPDF, an army that has uh, withstood a lot of uh, challenges uh, from the last 30 years. For me, I think, um, well, I, I think it speaks to propaganda. Whether someone is uh, trying to um, uh, portray uh, this rebel group as uh, a very serious one or it is not even there because for me um, a UPDF army I know the one that has been fighting in Somalia the one that uh, finished uh, LRA ADF should be finished as we speak but we continue to have this problem so there's something uh, in my opinion I think uh, we we really take them so seriously you know now we ha we are at a time when the East African Brigade is being formed to go and help pacify the Eastern DRC in areas of South Kivu, where we have the M23 take on the DRC National Army. But the same brigade is comprised of, of course, of the East African partner states, including the UPDF. So what would that happen when the UPDF is taking on, has a mandate from the, from the Kinshasa, an agreement with Kinshasa, take on the, the rebels of ADF in in, in Eastern Congo, but at the same time, they are supposed to form a brigade that, together with the other East African states, that are supposed to pacify uh, Eastern DRC, if anything, to stop the, the, resur the resurgence of M23. Won't, won't that cause more complications? I don't think so, because Uganda, if you look at what has happened in Toroko, it is the ADF that crossed over to Uganda. Uganda, even when you have a brigade in DRC, you still protect your border you still guard uh, your, your, your territory as a country. Uh, it's a portion of the UPDF uh, fighting in the other brigade of the East African community. So I don't think that is a problem. But the issue is, um, we've been there before the brigade. Uh, the UPDF has been there before the brigade. And for me, it appears that nothing much has been achieved. You do not see tangible results, even on paper, even in terms of reporting. And we've used a lot of resources to really try and comb uh, the forest of Eastern Congo to find the ADF um, in there. But also the challenge in, in Congo is Congo has a number of rebel groups, um, which is not ADF, fighting other states. The Mai Mai, the Kodeko, and yes. all this. I'm told about a hundred rebel groups yes. in Eastern Congo. Yes, and this problem uh, from 19, you know where the problem um, came from, 1994, the genociders went to Congo. Actually, that's actually the genesis of most of these rebel uh, groups forming in DRC. The Hutu uh, genociders now live in there, fight the Rwandan government. You have the M23, uh, the Tusis, trying to protect, uh, the, uh, of course, uh, being protected by Rwanda and uh, speculation but, Uganda. By the way, the, the Rwanda has denied that, so... Yeah, it, it, it continues to deny by the UN um, experts and, and Belgium and France and, and other countries have really supported uh, the allegations made by the DRC. But okay, if you can hold there, if it is true that uh, former, the Rwandan genociders are hiding in the Congo, yes, and in some cases also armed and perhaps thinking of returning to, to Rwanda, and we also have ADF, which is uh, against Uganda, 
But you allow Kampala to go and hunt for their rebels in Congo. You don't allow Kigali to go and also hunt for those who are causing an existential threat to them. Is that even fair? But who, who gives you permission to um, come to your territory? It is, Congo it's, is a sovereign state. It is a sovereign state. And the fact but that but it's don't you think Kigali has a point? If Uganda can be given the, you know, a leeway to go and, and hunt for the Ugandan rebels in the Congo, then Kigali, Kigali was which has faced a major problem that we are in terms of, uh, if, in terms of FDLR. F FDR. Yeah. Mm. Th they too, it's, in fairness, should be given the, the opportunity to go and hunt for their rebels, just like Uganda has gone into the Congo. Because they say, well, we also face a problem. The Hutu rebels in the Congo are giving us an existential threat, as much as ADF is causing an existential threat to Uganda. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the leadership of the DRC and the leadership of Kigali are having serious issues. Um, at first, when uh, Sheshekedi became president, we thought uh, that the relations between Rwanda and, and the DRC would improve. But uh, as we've seen, it is not, it's, it's actually um, it's even worse. Uh, these two heads of state are exchanging um, serious. Yeah, serious but yes, we, 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 we can we, and, and putting that aside. I'm, I'm only trying to find out from you, from international relations perspective. You mm -hmm. as a lecturer of international relations, that is it. All not only f is it not just fair, but you see, but you see, um, uh, when we talk about international relations, we talk about the issue of sovereignty. Countries should always determine what they do. And, and who they should bring in and who should come to their territory. So Congo as a country, can, if they do not, they do not agree with um, Rwanda, and if Rwanda has no legitimate reasons to go to Congo, then Congo can, um, can refuse um, Rwandese from going to, I mean, to hunt for the, the Hutu rebels. Do, do you realize that if Kinshasa allowed Kampala mm -hmm. to get in, to hunt for the Ugandan rebels in Congo, Kigali also ha actually has a, a bigger problem in the Congo that would have been fair them too but, but, to be uh, allowed but the to go and hunt for their rebels. The Congolese al allege that uh, the problems of, of, of Eastern Congo have been brought up by Chigali. So they are saying we cannot accept uh, for, you to come. for you to come. So, so how is that going to play out now that we have so many rebels in North Kivu and this other bigger rebel of M23 in South Kivu and yet uh, the, the, the regime in Kinshasa is pointing fingers at a neighboring state which is a partner state of the East African community and you have an East African brigade in there. Isn't Congo going to, give, to get even more messy in your view? It is already messy and uh, for me I think uh, one of um, uh, the issues that are very, very critical to this discussion is the fact that um, President Kagame and President Felix Shechekedi do not see eye to eye. And that is a very big problem in my opinion because if you really want to uh, sit down and have a conversation about the problems in DRC, you start with leadership. And if uh, one of them is saying you're not elected, you're just... Uh, planted there, and the other one is saying we can attack you. We are no longer weak. We are not the DRC of Mobutu. We have we have a different ball game, so we can take you on. And you've seen this affect the situation. So for me, uh, in my opinion, I think we can only start talking about uh, peace in the Eastern DRC when we have uh, sober minds when it comes to leadership. And these guys are not sober as well. But you know, the problems of the DRC are not the problems of the 90s. These mm -hmm. are problems started much earlier, in, even in the 60s. You remember when, when Uganda was accused during the Obote regime, you remember the, the Congo gold scandal? Yes. Where they accused that the Obote and Amin had, had looted gold in the Congo. It is the same Congo where we lost an, a whole United Nations Secretary General, mm -hmm. Doug Hammarskjöld, again on a peace mission. Yes. And his plane crashed in the Congo. And an Italian an ambassador. An Italian ambassador mm -hmm. has died in the Congo. So the problems of Congo but, have not been Congo But, uh, but, but uh, Kamara, let me, um, <coughs> one of the things you forget is there is untapped 24 trillion worth of US uh, dollars in Eastern <coughs> Congo. And this is not something to joke about. So 
it can be that people will want gold. because in the story of the energy transition yes f from from fossil fuel to clean energy yes. Yes. congo is going to become the new saudi arabia hold on to your point uh, uh mr tabalanga because we're going to take a break and on the spot we'll be right back Welcome back. You're watching On The Spot. My name is Patrick Amara. My guest in the studio is International Relations Lecturer, Mr. Tabalang. And earlier we had our NNG correspondent in Toroko, Alex Shaba. I just want now, before I continue the discussion with this, Mr. Tabalanga, to bring you uh, the, uh, the, the views of President Yoweri Museveni and how he's been working together with the Congolese President, uh, 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 Felix Eskedi. We shall defeat them. We defeated them here. They were, they were from here. We defeated them. The RRA coin were here. We defeated them. So they go to, to kill our brothers and sisters in the Congo. They, once in a while, they come and plant bombs here and kill some sheikhs. That one we... The ADF will come and chase people and harvest the cocoa and sell it and get money. And they had business agents in the towns there, Beni, Goma, even here in Uganda, they had business agents who were selling the stolen coffee for them to get money, to, li to, to live a good life, to send to their families, but also to, to buy materials to make bombs and so on. They are talking about ADF and how they have lived in Congo, uh, you know, benefiting from the Congolese resources, stealing from the Congolese people so that they can sell their, their, their merchandise and sell their products, cook on the rest to make money and also buy weapons. Uh, Jonathan, you know, after 20 years, until recently when we saw bombs happening in Kampala, uh, suicide bombs, and also before that there was the killing of sheikhs and, and an attempt on the life of General Katumbra. But before that, ADF was actually almost in hibernation yes and how do, nobody was, was hearing about it but the, did it necessitate having such a huge force with such huge resources to get in the congo and and take on guys who are actually carrying ieds yeah uh, because um we need to go back to when uh, jamil mukuru um the jamil head, mukuru is in uganda yes, custody. who was arrested by uh, who was i think um uh, arrested in, the, in Tanzania in Tanzania then of course um, brought to Uganda and then he faced uh, justice in Uganda but I thought when Mukulu was arrested uh, that was it but then uh, we've seen a resurrection of this um, ADF and the bombing of uh, Kampala and then uh, you have now them the operation Suja because I think when the, there was uh, the bombing in Kampala then it necessitated the government of Uganda to send these forces, of course, requesting the DRC to allow them, because you have to uh, when you're dealing with sovereign states. But then um, when you look at the situation now, it doesn't really uh, speak to um, our strength. It speaks to the fact that um, the ADF has evolved. They change with time. Um, they change their tactics. Of course, they have a new commander. I yeah. think it's called Sheikh, Sheikh Musa Baluku. Yes. Uh, as, who replaced Jamil Mukulu, who is now in custody. Yes. So um, I think for me, uh, even when we talk about Operation Suja, we don't really see tangible results, I told you earlier. Uh, it is just combing the jungles and nothing uh, coming out from these jungles. But for me, I think the ADF has really evolved and it is really operating in a very unconventional way, um, laying low and then waking up and then attacking, and of course using Congolese uh, to fight. So for me, I think it's a problem for us, and we need to set up an intelligence um, network in Eastern Congo to deal with this problem. If we don't do that, then... But, you know, there is, there is, a, there is, a, there is a problem that has maybe Uganda or the rest of the world has not paid much attention, and that's in the areas of North Kivu. If you come to areas of Bunia and Beni, uh, even up to areas of, uh, of Mahagi, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, you have tribal 
conflicts, ethnic, the Gegere uh, fighting the, the, the Hema, the Hema fighting the Lendu, you know, the, the, the cattle keeping communities fighting the other the cultivators. We, you have people called the group called the Kodeko who are also fighting. It's, it's, it's a, a crucible of fighters in the Congo hitting on each other, and all of them are Congolese. Yes. Um, this has been a problem for Congo for quite a long time. And for me, I think um, the fact that Kinshasa is very far away from Eastern Congo, sometimes they don't really give attention to this other part of uh, their country. And the fact that also um, the interest of the neighbors within this particular place, uh, it can fuel these conflicts. But of course, when we talk about uh, cattle keepers, and cultivators, we know the problem. The problem is you have people grazing their animals um, in the areas where they are growing crops, and that causes conflict, even in Uganda. So for me, that is really uh, understandable. But the real issue is what comes from here in Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi, and Heights in Congo, and what is the reason? And then you have also the Europeans and the other uh, development, development partners who are also interested in what is in Congo. I told you about the 24 trillion untapped res mineral resources in Congo. And nobody in the world would not want to get a piece of that. And how do you get a piece of that? Sometimes through conflict. Um, if there is conflict in Congo, the better. Because now it means they have leverage. They can go and negotiate in DRS. With, with the... With the Yes, with the rebel I, was, chiefs. I, 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 I met a with the warlords. Yes, I met a, um, a student from Diara Congo, who was um, being employed by an American farm in Eastern Congo, unregistered farm mining gold uh, in Congo, and and this is what is is happening in Congo. So for me, I think sometimes it's it is actually what these people want that Congo is not. Um, peaceful because if it's peaceful then they will go down so which which you are saying that as we tr as the world transitions yes from fossil fuel to cleaner energy from you know looking for rare rare earth minerals uh, because the biggest they say the biggest chunk of rare earth minerals that are supposed to power the world is in DR Congo in, in, in the coming years is in DR Congo which means uh, when Congo becomes the next the new Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. then it also becomes a bigger problem for Congo I, yes and 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 first of all strategically a number of world powers are interested uh, in this piece of, of wealth and how do you get that first of all you need to create a problem if you don't create a problem then you can't really uh, be important in the eyes of the Congolese so um, but if we, we, we look at the history of Congo, of course there have been problems, but also the survival of states like Rwanda and Uganda depends on what is happening in Eastern Congo, because this place is ungovernable. A number of rebel groups can hibernate there, they can set um, base there, and they can, I mean, aim there and come to Uganda. There is a feeling that now that Democratic Republic of Congo joined the East African community as the new member of the community, that perhaps that could eventually help in solving the Congo problem once and for all. Yeah, um, of course, you know, this is the beginning. And, and you know, integration is gradual. It is not automatic. It's not something that really happens the way you want it to happen. A number of things have to really uh, work out uh, for Congo to really be integrated in this African community. If even you look at the, the four or the five that have been uh, in this uh, uh, region, I mean, that have been members of the East African community. They're not really integrated. We know that there's a problem with the, uh, the political issue, there's a problem with the currency, there's a problem with a number of other, even the protocols to do with um, origin of goods and services. So there are a number of problems within the region itself. So Congo coming in, yes, it's a big market. And I, I had welcomed uh, the initiative by the government of Uganda. Of course, people criticized it when we wanted to construct um, roads, in the, roads Congo. in the Congo, because that is very important. And those who criticize that, that project in, do not understand why it is always important to set up a road network, a communications network, in a place that is ungovernable and reachable. That is the first step. But also, 
there is a need of advocacy and education, a lot of it to be done in the DRC. So now we have the East African uh, state or the East African communities stretching from the Indian Ocean to the Atlantic, mm -hmm. from Mombasa on the Indian Ocean to Kinshasa on the Atlantic. That alone, uh, probably now creating a population of almost 300 million people, Yes. that alone, if well used, if well utilized, could actually become Africa's super state. Exactly. It could really um, lead to enormous, enormous uh, benefits for the people living in this region. Uh, but the problem is you cannot achieve this with insecurity. The first element of development or the first, um, uh, the only way you can develop is when you have a peaceful yeah. environment. The peace and stability. Yes. But you know, peace and stability should have come to the part of Eastern DRC and the entire Congo because you have the biggest United Nations peacekeeping force in the Congo for more than 20 years. But it has been uh, accused... Uh, it has been accused. Is, isn't it a shame that a world force of the United Nations is in the Congo for more than 20 years, and I'm told they use about a billion dollars in a month, and yet the Congo problem is only getting worse. But it has been accused. As they stand by and watch. But it has been accused of shielding um, uh, looters, people who come to Congo and, and, and steal uh, the mineral wealth. In, in Congo. It is also, of course, they were successful at the beginning. Um, they managed to fight and, and eliminate um, the M23 at that time. Of course, they, they came back to Uganda. Some of them, you remember the story. But then, of course, the resurrection of the M23. And this time, uh, M23 is more of a determined force. They, they look at actually taking power uh, in Kinshasa. And of course, the accusations coming from Kinshasa about Rwanda. But for me, I think um, the Munsok in Congo had initially it had done a very good job. Now, it is not the same story because I, I only look at them as a money making. All right. Um, Let me just hold on to your point because I want to uh, replay the bait of uh, President Paul Kagame of Rwanda talking about these issues of Congo and the instability there in, in, in the Great Lakes region. Let's have Paul Kagame. The last few decades, I'm not going into 60s, I'm not going into late 50s, no. I'm just talking about the last nearly 30 years now. You would wonder, I'm sure people should be asking themselves, how can these problems that relate to Rwanda, that relate to DRC, that relate to all these groups I'm talking about, that relate to the whole region, that relate to the powerful countries that so much talk about humanitarian crisis and human rights and all kinds of things and really speak up for wanting to resolve all this. Sit with this kind of a situation and just keep massaging it and no, no, you know, blaming everybody else except them for these problems. And uh, it's unfortunate that uh, what I'm saying, I've given a short list of parties concerned, countries and so on. But it has become so convenient for long that all problems are put on the shoulders heavily on the shoulders of Rwanda. <laughs> Rwanda is always the culprit in all of this. It's not FDRR. 
It's not uh, the government of Congo that should be responsible for its problems and people. It's not the UN. It's not the powerful countries. Main America, UK, France. ETC? No, it's Rwanda. It's, it's Rwanda all the time. And it's M23 because of Rwanda. So it still comes back to Rwanda. It's not a Fudera, the remnants of the people who carried out genocide here. It's not uh, the government of Congo for many reasons. Reasons being, I started by saying here that we we don't have means, but, but we have weights. We have, don't have means, but we have weights. But we don't have means. And that's why, in the comparison, Rwanda and Congo, there is more, much more, much, much more. Congo offers to these people than Rwanda. So naturally, uh, these people must uh, trade carefully when they are dealing with the Congo's problems. Okay. They, they, they must even assist Congo to alleviate their, their pain by transferring the, the blame they should hold, should have, put somewhere else. And uh, the easiest place to put their blame. All right, uh, President Paul Kagame of Rwanda talking a couple of uh, days back on the matters of Congo, quite frankly, saying that the international community and other people seem to every time to pick on Rwanda, even when problems are inside Congo and are Congolese problems. He seems to suggest that they are pointing, are choosing fingers on whatever happens in the Congo on the nation of Rwanda, which is not fair because that Congo has its own issues. They have to manage their own problems. And there is the international community, including the United Nations, that is there. Why? Because Congo has what it can offer, and so they trade carefully. Those are his words. What do you make of that? I think it's, it's right to uh, make that statement because I, I told you earlier that um, this, the problem of Congo is a Congolese problem. It's not a Rwandese or a Ugandan problem. We can only seek permission to go and look for those who um, are dangerous on this side. So for me, I think uh, President Kagame really th feels like uh, Rwanda has been accused uh, in unfairly. unfairly and um, rightly so. Like you talked about uh, uh, the guys up north in the side of Kiev who are uh, fighting each other and they are Congolese. And you have also uh, other groups that are not even run. Fight, that they are not even genociders. Uh, and also, I think also President Kagame is aggrieved by the fact that you have a genocide, uh, the genociders in Congo, and nobody is talking about them. And that is his major concern. And these guys have been um, um, living, terrorizing, and doing whatever sorts of evil in the DRC. And Rwanda is, is too scared of these people, and they've never been given a chance to go and fight them. And for me, I think um, the president of Rwanda is very right when he castigates the international community for only thinking that Rwanda is the only destabilizer of the region. And yet we know that Congo as a country should take this upon themselves to deal with the problem.
All right, uh, it's a Jonathan Tabalanga. We are going to take a break, and when we come back, I want also to look into the old issues of Congo. When the UPDF was in the Congo in the 90s, but yet again hunting for ADF, we came back, but the Cong Congolese government took us to the International Court of Justice, <laughs> and up to today, we are still paying money to the Congolese government. I'm told we last paid about $65 million to them, even though the people who stole or plundered the resources of Congo were not, were not plundering or stealing in the name of Uganda. They are stealing for themselves. But in paying back the debt, we, the taxpayers' money, is being used to pay for the ills of individual soldiers. Is that even fair? We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching On The Spot. My name is Patrick Amara. My guest tonight is Jonathan Tabalanga. He's a lecturer of international relations. And we're looking into the issue of uh, conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where have the UPDF uh, carrying on Operation Shuja. The UPDF under Operation Shuja, this is not the first, this is not the first time no. we're there. The UPDF was there in the, 19, in the, 19, the late 90s and, and the early 2000s. Uh, I was actually one of the, of the journalists embedded with the UPDF around 2000, in the, in the 2000s to go in Bunya. I was there when the Uruguayan forces were being deployed as a UN contingent. Hmm. And I was there when uh, General Kale Kaihura took on the forces of Tomalu Banga in Bunya. And I think I remember it was David Mohozi who was a battalion commander there. So I, I saw the chaos a little bit as, as, as a war correspondent in the Congo. But now they're back in the Congo at a time when the Kinshasa government took Uganda to International Court of Justice, demanding reparation, apparently they accused us of Plunder. plundering resources, killing and maiming and plundering, and, and, and Uganda accepted to pay. What pains me is that we are paying money. <laughs> we are paying money to the Congo state because our soldiers were accused of looting. These soldiers did not loot, loot Congolese resources if they did in our name. These soldiers looted for them. Why, can, why should taxpayers' money be used to pay the Congo state for the plan of the Congolese resources by individual soldiers who are known, who had a command and control structure that you can go for them? Uh, but, isn't, but, that, isn't that funny? But Patrick, who were they representing in Congo? Were they there as individuals or they were um, representing the country of Uganda? They had gone for a mission, and they were Ugandans, and they carried the name Uganda. That's uh, very true. The, what I'm trying to No, for Congo, if, if Congo is right to take us perhaps to the ICG, if they, if, if they are because aware. You see, but what I'm trying to ask is, you know, it an, becomes, army, an army has a, a, a command and control. Yes. If somebody stole, those individuals, if we're going to pay as a state, the individual commanders who are there should be paying too. <laughs> they should be punished because, okay, where did the money go? Did they steal that money and bring it and put it in Bank of Uganda? Because it's difficult now, because you see, um, the Congolese government, when the Congolese government took us to uh, the International Court of Justice, uh, it was incumbent on the government of Uganda to uh, investigate, to carry out an investigation internally. Exactly. To, to um, f uh, try and investigate and see if these accused individuals were responsible for the plunder in the DRC. But remember, even uh, going to the DRC, um, the DRC was not in agreement with this kind of uh, occupation by the Ugandan forces in its territory. No, no, by the time we accept mm -hmm. to pay reparations, it means we have accepted that our forces looted, they plundered. No, because we put up a defense at the ICJ and we lost. And as a member of the international community, every time you lose a case, then you have to pay. You remember, we've been um, uh, fighting in... Um, in uh, Jonathan, my issue is that Uganda, we, we lost a case. Yes, and yes, we, we have did. to pay. But the Ugandan government should investigate the individual they never, commanders. They never responsible. investigated. They should that investigate. Is, for me, that is my issue. If, if, if there are soldiers in the command and control structure of those who were deployed in the Congo and stole the Congolese gold and whatever, they should be investigated. We, we, as we pay the Congolese state, commanders, if they are still there, who are in the Congo should be able, should be investigated. 
I, I think I think. Uh, I mean, how can we how can we cover for them? I think if you've been looking at the UPDF, um, they've never no commander of the UPDF who has operated outside the territory of this country, even when they've committed atrocities, they've never been tried. It is they've always been protected because it is always alleged that they. All this has been done on behalf of us. Oh, the they looted for us? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the citizens of this country. But of course, I, I agree with you. Um, they lost the case at the ICJ. And that the implication is we acknowledge that we've looted uh, these uh, uh, resources from the DRC. But I mean, um, for me, my, my only uh, point of departure from that is the fact that we, as a country, do not even try and, and investigate okay. um, so, what happened so, in Congo. So how do we, don't you think now, now you have, you have the UPDF back in the Congo uh, when they're paying reparations, it is the same army and the, under, the, under the same uh, system? You think the problems of the past cannot be repeated? They can be repeated. They can be repeated. And um, you see, people always talk about history and they think history does not repeat itself. People think it's just a statement. This is a serious statement. Uh, I mean, you have people in the Diara Congo, outside um, your eyes, you the journalists who always report on these issues. It's very easy for you to move into, um, uh, Ashaba has been in, 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 in Toroko, but you don't have so many reporters in Congo reporting about this crisis or this engagement uh, we have uh, trying to look for the ADF in Congo. And how many stories come from Congo about our operations? This is the question you should be asking. If you meet the, the UPDF, ask them. But the little I've gathered from the Congolese is that the ordinary Congolese are happy to have the UPDF on their territory. They seem to have created some kind of peace. They can be able, especially in the areas where DF was, they can be able to harvest and sell their produce. And, 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 the, and, this, and the truth be told, uh, Apart from these allegations of looting, but the UPDF is a disciplined of, it of, is. It's a disciplined army. It is. In fact, they get surprised to hear that they have looted. It is. It is. But also, um, in every uh, every structure, there is always a problem. I don't really think that is. Uh, we could stand here and condemn the UPDF for what happened in Congo, because I mean, these were individuals, as you said, and um, uh, but of course, we as a country should have a at least try to investigate to see um, if this guy is really uh, looted. But of course, there are stories out there of the commanders who are involved um, in the routing. And um, we as a country never really uh, try to uh, find out exactly what happened. But of course, Congo as a country, I told you, it is one place where someone goes and they expect to get rich. It is 24 trillion uh, worth of untapped resources and people really want to be there. Not only Ugandans, but everybody in the world wants to be in Congo to tap on what is in there. As we try to conclude our discussion tonight, I just want maybe to open the lines. I can have one or two callers, if you can just tell us what you think. Or if you have a question for Jonathan Tabalanga, this is the moment. The, our number is going to be on the screen. You look at it and uh, you tell us your name and where you're from. And if you have a question, please ask. Uh, this is your moment when you have to have your say um, before we conclude because we need to hear your views as well. Uh, so do you think Operation Shuja will eventually, you know, will they meet their, their goals? Well, they have uh, killed quite a number of ADF rebels in the Ugandan territory, but still their commanders are still across. Uh, Sheikh Musa Baluku and his group are still there. And the Congo, even if you put in 10 brigades there or an entire division, they'll get lost in the Congo. It's such a vast territory. Even the entire East African force, you can put it in the Congo and they'll get lost in the Congolese jungle. Yeah, because uh, we, for me, my problem is, do we have stock of, um, the, the, I mean, of how many rebels uh, comprises of uh, the ADF's, um, I mean, forces? Because we do not know what we are dealing with. We only talk about children. We talk about, the other day you, you had um, someone who looks like a Somali being um, arrested as one of the spokespeople of, of the ADF. So for me, I think we do not know the, the capacity and the numbers we are dealing with in terms of uh, ADF. Because now, if you even have children, then you don't know how many people are in these jungles and they're fighting for the ADF. 
I just want to thank you so much, Mr. Jonathan Tabalanga, lecturer of international relations, for having added value to our understanding of the region. Thank you so much. I want to thank you, the viewer, for the privilege of your company. We are hopeful that the Congo and the region will, be, will come out okay uh, with the UPDF there trying to do what they can to neutralize the ADF rebels. And we hope that the, the East African Standby Brigade that is being, is being deployed in Goma to pacify the region will also do a good job so that this region can have some peace because it's only peace that can help for the region to develop. And uh, I want to thank you so much. And from us here on, on the Sports Show, we want to wish you a Merry Christmas and a prosperous New Year of 2023. Merry Christmas, good night, and God bless Uganda.